we're finally back to the podcast. So now we actually have a name and we have a guest, Mr. Rusty. Hello. So our name is DGen Valley. And just to kind of give you a brief, like, you know, information dump right now, we are doing a series called Meet the Team. We are meeting the founders, we're meeting team members, we're bringing them on and basically talking to people about what they do, like their daily tasks and more or less like their history. And also just like anything else that comes with it, because it's just like a normal podcast too. So in doing so, I think it'd be nice to kind of get a brief overview of a little bit of your past, like not, not too much, but just like what got you into IT? Yeah. I was or born to IT and computer science. <laughs> yeah. I was born in a small town. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so I've, I've, I've always been into technology. Um, I was the AV nerd. I was, you know, I was the guy that always had some interesting computers. Uh, and just last week, my mom sent me a, um, a photograph of myself at 16 laying on the, no, 15, laying on the floor of our living room with a computer spread everywhere. Now, 15, that, that makes that my first computer, and that was an 8086. Yeah. So, I mean, that was, wow. it had a physical turbo button on it that made it an 8088. Wow. It was pretty <laughs> awesome. And this thing is spread across the living room, all of the components taken apart, and I'm reassembling everything. And I've just always been that guy. So, yeah. it was really, I knew in high school that I was going to be in systems engineering. I knew that I was going to do technical operations. Yeah. It was going to be the computer industry somehow, and I knew it was going to have to do with hardware with building systems and just always loved it. What was your first transition from like, um, like a hobbyist to like more of like a legitimate job? Yeah. So I, I, it was sort of a stage transition. Um, in, in, at university, I, I became a lab tech. And that's how I did sort of my funding. So my financial aid. Um, so I was a lab tech. And so I would, uh, at nights I would rebuild labs at the school um, during the day between classes. I would work for, T group. Um, and then I, uh, after that, I moved to um, a test and measurement facility for Hewlett Packard. Um, nice. And I was rebuilding printers and it was um, rebuilding printers, uh, like full on mechanical rebuilds. And then um, I actually helped their engineering team that was working on some component or something, help them uh, stabilize their computing environment. And this was with Windows for Work Group. This is way back. Ago. Yeah. <laughs> this is way back in the day. Um, and really, and, and this person doesn't know me anymore. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've never stayed in touch with this person. And they, they wouldn't know this at all, but they're probably the cornerstone of why I went with my career. I thought he was the coolest yeah. guy ever. And he, was, he had to have been six foot three, bald, in his 50s. He drove a, um, he drove a muscle car. I think it was a... Uh, Roadrunner. It was a bright orange Roadrunner. And, but he was, and that stuff didn't make him cool to me. What did was that, like, he wrote a piece of software yeah. in a weekend that the whole company used. And he stayed in the room eating pizza until it was done. And I thought that was like the coolest <laughs> thing cool. ever. I was like, this is what I'm going to do with my life. Like you're calling. Yeah. I was like, ah, <laughs> this is the pinnacle. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's. That's crazy. Like, I feel like when I talk to not necessarily like older guys, but people that have been in the industry for like a hot minute, mm -hmm. a lot of them are like terminal shell gods, <laughs> like people that like, you know, they lived in the terminal, they did everything like oh. that. I feel like you're like super similar just because of like, I, I'm assuming because the architecture back then is just like the way things kind of like went for you. Yeah. Do you feel that way as well? Like, right yeah, now? Uh, Nash is in here, yeah. but he's rolling his eyes about as hard as he possibly could right now. Really? Uh, <laughs> yeah. He makes fun of me mercilessly um so uh, the answer is yes and so yeah. i like nash and most of the other team here they come from a linux background yeah i am almost entirely the other side windows windows yeah now i say that and my first job when you look packard i worked on an hpux kayak like i it was so my start is with shell and yes i, I wrote a lot of um scripts and things in, in, in the DOS shell. Um, and so I've always done that. And, you know, obviously later on PowerShell. Um, but I would say that I am, I'm good at shell. Yeah. But I definitely haven't lived my life. In it. Um, I spent a long period in my career actually doing production database administration. Yeah. Um, but really that was only interesting to me because it combines three really complicated components. 
networking, storage, and compute, yeah. and puts them all into one single application that you have to manage. And so it was a really fun problem to try and solve how to do reliably and at scale. But I, I think there's something that's kind of like unsaid about people that have like more of a technical background in like um, like service desk or administration, yeah. and then transition more into like CS or like developers or system engineering, where it's like I, I honestly feel like it's like a, a strength that a lot of people don't understand. It's like they have a better I don't know, a better time like diagnosing things. And I feel like that kind of has changed people that just jump straight into programming. Like, yeah, no, I, I think that's fair. I think, it, and what's, um, what's funny is we were talking about this earlier, I think. I, I think people that enter the, the te- technology workforce today, the toolkits and the things that are in place to assist them in learning and to set up their environments, they're all very simple. Yeah. It's super easy to sit down at an empty workstation and turn it into a developer laptop. Yeah. That is not how it was 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and, you know, guys like Nash and, and, and Mike, they were writing code in VI and they were writing code in text and then compiling it themselves. And like, yeah. that's how a lot of these guys learn. And um, I, you know, similarly building infrastructure from scratch is very similar. Like, yeah. Nash and I were laughing about having to uh, modify drivers yeah. to get the performance that we wanted out of certain systems. And like now, if you talk to anybody, yeah, like tell me what a driver file is. Yeah, where would you find that? Like, what would it be named? Yeah, like those are things you probably don't know. Well, I you might. Yeah, you have some <laughs> like I do. Like, <laughs> drivers are a nightmare. But, but, but yeah, yeah, they're a total nightmare. Yeah. But you know, a lot, a lot of the people. I think you're right. A lot of people in the workforce now. It's not an experience. But they like get. to like kind of dish out a compliment to you. Like I knew right away, and this sounds really stupid. But like when we first talked, and like you showed me how to do like some deployments, I remember being like, "Oh no!" Like you, I didn't know your background at all. But I was like, yeah. "I think you have a background in like service desk or something, like something oh, like yeah. more technical, because of the way you could explain things to me." And I think that's kind of what's like really special about people on this team, but more in particular you is like, you're really good at explaining stuff Mm -hmm. and like being able to like teach people more or less like how things are done. Because a lot of times like really high up, like whether it's a systems admin or, you know, what, whatever, pick your, your flavor. They, once they get to a certain level, they don't want to teach anyone. And you're like the opposite. Where like I think that if like people recorded you, <laughs> we could like put you on YouTube and like people would like learn all the stuff all yes. the time. My YouTube followers, let's <laughs> exactly. do this. No, I um that is in part very uh the result of, of a very conscious behavior. Um I actually hold very firmly to if you can't explain something to somebody, yeah, you don't really understand it. Yeah. Um to really have the ability to teach somebody, you have to master it. Yeah. You have to know because you have to be able to answer the questions. Yeah. And you have to be able to respond. And so I for me, I don't really feel like I've learned something or know something until I can sit down. Yeah. And I can talk to you about it. Or I can take you know, someone who's uninducted in, in a particular technology and and say, here, this is how this works. Yeah. Um, but I also have I also have kind of a different experience than a lot of people have in IT. Yeah. Um one is in high school I did weird things. Yeah. Um I did forensics debate. Uh, I did impromptu. I in middle school I was in drama and band, and so I have these performance backgrounds where I'm just not afraid. Yeah, just not afraid to talk to people. And then in my career, like I also have very few boundaries. So as like a junior IT admin, I would go to the CEO and be like, "Hey, how can I help you with your stuff today? Yeah, is there anything I can help you with?" And they'd look at me like I was insane, and they're like, "Um, if I need you, I'll talk to your boss." Yeah, I was like, "Cool." All right. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, so like I, I ended up as a, as my career developed, I ended up spending a lot of time with groups and teams and people who really didn't have technology yeah. experience. And then I was the only person on the technology side of the house that would talk to anyone. Mm. And so that skill just kind of snowballed and I became better and better at talking and better and better at helping people understand and learned what worked and what didn't work. Like getting angry and yelling weirdly doesn't help people understand things. Yeah, yeah. yeah weird, exactly. right? Being frustrated doesn't help. But, yeah, it, it's just so funny how like I think that trait is so overlooked sometimes now. Just like the the ability to like have basic communication. Mm-hmm. Totally. Agree and with like that. like with what, kind of like piggybacking what you're saying. Like I've always subscribed to that idea too. Almost like a different level where it's like I think until you truly understand a concept or an idea and you can explain it at different levels, 
it's like if you can explain it to like your niece that's like 10 years old or you know your mom or whatever like these different levels and different levels of concepts yeah you really don't truly understand what you're talking about and honestly that's kind of why i like this this podcast and like talking to people because it lets me learn as well because it's like how do i explain this better and like how do i i have to understand it at a different level yeah yeah. But I, I would say that like, yeah, definitely. That's like one of your strengths. And oh, like, I think that like, maybe that's just because of the longevity of your career, like where you've been pushed to, but like, I can see that definitely every time we talk in any capacity. Yeah. I, I also just love to, I, and, and it, that's really complimentary to me yeah. because I actually really do like to teach. I like, I like feeling like I've helped someone learn something or yeah. do something or, and, and that comes out of a real, out of a service background yeah. too. Right. Like, and I, at a help desk. Yeah. Right? You learn on yeah. the desk. <laughs> you learn. And like, if you don't, you, you won't make it in IT if you don't yeah. like helping people. Yeah. It's a yeah, huge deal. <laughs> you, yeah. You have to have a customer service mentality. And, and so. you have to be able to like, I mean, service desk for people that, that don't really understand this, like it's like level one. <laughs> if you're like yeah. in a video game, like you are like a peon, <laughs> like you're learning everything. <laughs> like, you know, you basically everything rolls downhill and you're at the bottom of the hill. Yeah. So it's like when people get upset about their printers not working and their drivers not working, like you're the first person that's going to get like yelled at people will scream at you. Right. Like they basically take, like it was seriously the first time I worked at a service as job, I felt like, like an anger management counsel, like yeah. counselor, like people just like scream at me and I'm like, Whoa. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And pe- that's the washout stage too. Cause yeah. like people are like, Whoa, screw this. I'm out. Yeah. Like, like I'm, I'm not going to do this. And then those of us who like kind of, get it we're like oh i'll just disarm this person yeah. figure out what's wrong see yeah. if i can help them if i can't i'll move them up to the next person and i give them a happy person yeah not an angry person yeah and uh, learning that skill of disarming someone who's upset yeah. oh my gosh if there's anything i can say in life to do figure out how to effectively disarm people when they're upset yeah because everybody's rightfully upset when they're upset. Nobody thinks that I, no when when someone's upset, no one's thinking to themselves, you know, I really probably shouldn't be this upset. You know, they're just rightfully upset. Mm. But if you can help them kind of de-escalate a little, yeah. And then it's always something like, I spilled coke on my keyboard. Yeah, or something's like <laughs> or something so <laughs> dumb that you just like it. I I one time helped a lady one time and she was storing her files in the trash bin. Like she literally thought that was like legitimate. Oh, she place. legitimately had a like she literally file had, and it was like solution. tax files. So it was like she was literally just putting these files in the trash bin, and she was like upset that she couldn't find it. And I was oh, like, no. I just talked to her, and I was like, "Where are you putting these files?" And she's like, "Well, I just put them in this little bin because that's where things belong in the bin." And I'm like, "Excuse me, <laughs> it's just trash." But the, the, what the point I'm getting at is, a lot of times when you help people, you understand that like. A lot of people don't know technology at all. Yeah. Like they don't have a firm grasp on any little concept at all. And it's just like, they get frustrated. Yeah. And that's what happens at all levels of like, whether it's IT or computer science or anything else. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of want to go back to, you were talking about like your time at Healer Packard and then like, wh- what was your next thing? Cause I kind of derailed us for a little <laughs> bit. Oh man, there have been many things. So I have a very different career trajectory than most people. Um, so most people will do some university, get a gig stay at that gig for years and years, yeah. maybe get another gig, you know, eight, 10 years later. And by the time they're where they're, where I'm at in my career, maybe they've had two or three jobs. Yeah. I've had more than 19. <laughs> wow. So um, I've done, and I think that I stop at 19 because I, I'm not sure really what the number is. It, it's probably higher, but I did a ton of um, short-term contracting and consulting. Yeah. Um, my, my very intentional career path was to develop as broad a set of experience as I possibly could because I really felt like what happens in technology is um, technology is used to mitigate issues with com- for complex problems and then simplify those problems, make it easier to solve. Yeah. And then that's a bottom layer. And then the next pass of security or next pass of, or not security, technology or innovation is to take those problems and simplify those. And so I I had this idea in my head at the time where I was like, if I have as broad an experience set as possible, then as all of those layers start to stack up and then flaws begin to show up in the bottom, I know how all that works. Yeah. I know how TCP IP works. I know how uh, storage works. Um, And so... I took all these different weird short careers and I was, um, 
it's been, there's been moments where it's been very limiting. Like I've had interviews with places that would have been great to work, great, great names to have on my resume. And they're like, why do you have all these jobs? And some people just don't want to hear that I have them because I'm developing me, not you. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I'm, I'm in, I'm employed by the enterprise of Rusty yeah. and I'm developing me. And it was, um, so, uh, it, it, it's, it's all over the place. Um, I've worked at Microsoft. Um, I was at Xbox Live Network Operations Center, um, writing a global metrics platform, um, that, that, um, pulled data out of their servers and databases when Halo 2 launched. Wow. Right. That's where I um, like spent most of my yo- like youth is in Halo you 2. You and me both, man. Oh my God. I got, there were, there were times where I was paid to play. So we had to do play testing. So just picture six people in this place at the same, at a horseshoe table, each with a TV and an Xbox playing Halo 2. Yeah. There were a lot of really sad other people in, <laughs> in the oh. network where we would just camp and destroy these poor people. And we're in the same room coordinating live, you know. Anyways, it was a lot of fun. But that's, you know, that's one gig. Um, I spent some time at Wild Tangent as a database uh, administrator. Um, I've worked for law firms. I've worked for hospitals. I've um, been all over the place. I've worked for the U.S. government um, as a civilian contractor, um, uh, installing VPN devices in their payment network or pay- their payroll network. Um, I've just had a lot of strange experiences, a lot of different um, touch points. And they've all in- been in different technology, like network and storage and servers and software. and um, it, you know, it really wasn't until probably the last decade that I made a shift into this this developing DevOps and SRE thing. And I was like, oh, look at all of my weird knowledge in these places really comes in handy in this DevOps and SRE space. Like I can touch all these different things and they all work a lot better than they did you know, 10, 15 years ago, but they still all have coordination problems. They still have integration problems. And I can I can use the tools that we have to to make that easier for teams. Yeah, yeah, that kind of. I, it's interesting that like you're talking about like how you had like you've had at least like 19 jobs in this space and it's like been all over the place because, and I, I think it's kind of weird because it's like I look at like the career field now and a lot of people are kind of moving towards that where mm-hmm. like back in the day like people would hold jobs for like 10 15 years like my dad held a job for like it's like 40 something years yeah <laughs> and it's like now it's like people in our space especially like it's like every two or three years they bounce yep and it's like i think it's because they've adopted that model of like i'm building myself and they know that they're worth something more and i think it's hard for a lot of um specifically tech companies to kind of keep up to date with like how they keep these people happy because a lot of times it's not just free pizza and like video games yeah, it doesn't cut it like anymore. that's not that's not it yeah. like you know like coming into an office and like having a place where you feel like legitimately needed and like you feel like the work that you're doing is special yeah. is like a big part of it i think so i think in a lot of ways you're kind of like ahead of the curve where like i think maybe in like 40 years from now people that are kind of like in their 20s now or just entering the field are going to have similar like 19 25 jobs because they're just gonna be bouncing every two or three years when so I don't want to date myself here, but uh, (laughs) I entered the workforce in 96. So um, that was right at the tail end of the generation who got retirements. Yeah. Right. And so I knew all of these older people who had retirements, they had a retirement strategy. And then I was entering the workforce and I'm like, uh, people are pulling all the retirement Mm. and they're giving us 401k. I was like, all right, 401k. All right. You know, what's the mentality there? I save my money and I build my own wealth. Mm. Like, All right, well, that seems like a rational idea. I'll do that. And then you know, fast forward 10 years and no successful retirements on 401k. Yeah. It's like, all right, so what does this mean? What am I going to have to do? Like, what is this? And I think you're absolutely right. I think, uh, one, I, I am a little early. I'm not alone. There's a lot of yeah. people who are doing this. Um, but we are early. And I think in 20 years, it's going to be really commonplace. But I mean, it's, there's a very clear side effect here. Yeah. You stop giving people a reason to stay for 20 years. Like they're going to bounce. They're going to bounce. They're going to, especially when you get, especially when you get companies that don't treat people right. Yeah. You get leaders who have terrible ethics and 
people will bounce. People yeah. make their own personal decisions. And it's just so funny because it's like when I, uh, my mom's going to listen to this podcast and she's going to kind of like laugh right now. But like when I talk to her and like anyone in that generation, I think it's very crazy for her to see her son like jumping jobs every couple of years. Oh, yeah. She's like, what do you mean? Like, that's a good job. Like, hold on to it forever. Like, because that mentality is <laughs> right. kind of like what it was back then, you know? And yeah. like, it's kind of hard for people that don't understand or maybe they aren't in this space, but it's like, you do have to balance every couple of years sometimes. Like, even if you're at a good place, like I have friends that work at Google, like Microsoft, all the places. It's like, they, they still will stay there for three years sometimes or four maybe. And it's like, then they still balance because it's like after a while, they're just, they feel like a cog in a machine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And part of that too is, you know, the, the previous generations, the speed of development and speed of innovation wasn't the same. Yeah. Like, Right now, you learn something three years later, it's useless. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah. Like, wow, that was an interesting three years. Yeah. What am I going to do next? But you're in this company where they want you to keep doing that, and you're watching that just nosedive. Mm-hmm. You're like, well, I can't stay. Yeah. Like, can't stay. It's, it's, it's a career-limiting move for me to stay in this position. Yeah. I used to call it career acrobatics. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, I mean, oh. That's a pretty good term. That's a cool technology. Nope, didn't make it. Yeah, like it's gone <laughs> for the next one. You know, <laughs> that's yeah. Funny. So, what was your? I mean, for a lot of people that don't understand, because when I my first job out of college, well, out of my master's program, I was actually a systems engineer. Nice. And I had no idea what it was. Yeah, like I remember I applied because I was just like applying to all these places, but I was like, I have no idea what it. Like I kind of understood that they build systems or whatever. Can you kind of explain that to some people? Because I don't think they quite understand or grasp like the idea of the difference between like systems engineering and like network engineering or even like a a general program or development job yeah yeah so systems engineering is is it is a like everything here in in technology there's layers to it right but systems engineering generally is the engineering practice of connecting different types of systems together so a really basic way to think about it would be connecting a um a cable wi-fi modem a computer and a printer. So a system engineer would look at the need to have those things connected and to perform certain functions with them and say, all right, what do I need? I need network cables. I need you know, whatever. I'm going to put all these things together. So at the out, that's kind of the outset of systems engineering. Now let's take that to some of the fun stuff, right? So today systems engineering is writing software that builds scalable and um, resilient infrastructure in the cloud and in data centers. Um, it's also designing physical infrastructure and putting together systems in a way that um, if something goes wrong, it stays running. You can remove commodity components and make those replaceable, things that are easy to get quickly. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of businesses and the reason why the cloud came in in a lot of ways is a lot of businesses struggle with keeping things running well. Mm -hmm. Um, And so systems engineering and SRE or systems reliability engineering, site reliability engineering, service reliability engineering, however you want to say it, is that practice and art and science of how do I keep things running and knowing they will fail? How do I keep delivering a service at the same level of quality? And, you know, uh, there's a, it's been kind of a fun transition and, and I think probably everybody would say this. Things were one way and now they're this way. And that yeah. transition was fun, but it's been a fun transition in this career because a lot of the things that, that were really, really hard have been solved. And now in this career, we have like this whole new set of problems, whole new landscape of problems to deal with. But systems engineering at the nuts and bolts is the designing, maintenance, and decommissioning of yeah. servers services that run on servers and systems and then the cloud is like a whole new yeah and i think that's like a good segue into more or less like what you do here right like you talked about scalability about systems going down and for them to be able to pop up easily like can you explain more or less what you do here and like what's what is like the what's the grand idea here for (laughs) for you (laughs) yeah so there's there's kind of two phases one right now where we're at in the history of this company is is developing this demo and um what i do for that is is both kind of a devops and a site reliability engineering service reliability engineering um it's getting the pipelines built or the systems built to deliver code to server so it can run in a way that's repeatable there's no touch 
Um, it doesn't have to, you know, you don't have to do anything manually. Um, the, so that demo piece is uh, taking what's been written by the, by the software engineers, putting it on a server and saying, how does it run? And then it doesn't run. So how do we trap <laughs> yeah. those errors and get them back to the developers? And how do we do that quickly? And so there's a lot of time spent speaking with the software engineering team and you know, product team and saying, what is the pain point right now? What's irritating to you? What's taking you forever? Uh, and then finding that thing and automating that out of existence. Yeah. Let me remove that problem for you so you can go faster. It's a lot of what I spend my time on. Yeah. And that's that demo phase. Once we're past the demo phase, um, I'm working on designing the reference architecture for node operators. Mm -hmm. And so the reference architecture is it's the model that node operators can look at and say, this is how an idealized version of this will work. Now, a lot of node operators in, in, in the crypto space now, they're, they're coming at this with experience from their own careers or from running other nodes. So they've got some SRE chops. They've got some yeah. IT chops. They, they kind of know where these things are. But nobody knows how to run our software except us. And every piece of software has its own little magic to, to making it run well and things that we know it does under certain circumstances and then tricks we employ to keep it from getting to those circumstances, right? So having a reference architecture and having tools that we use and the, the problems that we know about documented, built out uh, for these node operators is going gonna, is gonna to lend itself to a, a huge degree of success um, for the node operators. Um, Along with that is reducing the hurdles or reducing the barriers to entry. We want node operators to walk up and be able to go, I want to run a node mm -hmm. and go, here you go, run a node. Yeah. And that's it. You know, we don't want them to have to have a CS degree and, and have to have IT experience and have to have this. They should because that's how they're going to take their, their roles from a starting business to a really profitable mm -hmm. business. But we should be removing those barriers to entry. And, and that's like uh, when I speak to like a lot of my friends that do like node operations, just like as a, I t there's two different types of them, right? There's like the hobbyists that are kind of fiddling around with it. And yeah. like they're messing around with like more altcoins and they're trying to figure out more or less how they even get any sort of money from that. But there's also like another type that's been around for a minute and like they are doing like, you know, node operations for like Bitcoin and for Ethereum and like they're that's doing right. these big ones. And it's funny to see like talk to them because they always say about how like layer ones when they're first starting out, like the hardest thing is what you just said yeah. it's like there's no automation built in you basically have to be like a, a programmer on the side and you have to know what you're doing and it's like they hate it and it's like the minute that happens they're just like oh, i don't know if this is going to be worth it for me and they just bounce and it's I, I think it's interesting that you're taking the perspective of like hey we need to automate this stuff because otherwise no one's going to do it and the, the idea with like true decentralization is like you want as many people to do it as possible right yeah. like you don't just want like a handful of people right mm -hmm. right you know what i the we, we talk around numbers of nodes in our kind of ideal network scenario and it's thousands. It's not, it's not tens, right? And to introduce thousands of people to an idea, you've got to have some framework. You've got to have some, you've got to have some stuff laid out and set up for people. And you know, the way, the way I think about it personally is kind of back to that self-development model, right? Like these people want to make millions of dollars. How are we successful? When are we successful? we're successful when they make millions of dollars. Yeah. We want so them to do that. We yeah. want them to do that. Yeah. So if our success is contingent upon their success, then anything I can do to make that success more likely is in our benefit. Mm -hmm. And so by adding the automation, by removing barriers to entry, by eliminating the challenges that they might run into when they're setting these things up, that lets them focus on their business. Yeah. You know? And I would say too, like that should be, and this is going to be more for like everyone in web three. It's like, that is the biggest complaint I hear across the board. It's like, we have such a low user adoption rate because of how complicated it is to like get a wallet yeah. up and going just like for someone to get a wallet and put money in it. And like them, to, like much less people to stake coins, right? Like yeah. people don't understand. Like if you want like your mom to do it, you want this to be like a general thing that people do. Like it needs to get easier. Yep. Whether that's like purchasing NFTs easier, whether like the whole bit, right? Every single aspect of it, I think that's something that needs to be done at all companies, like whether it's a layer one, layer two, like individual projects, 
is the ease of use. Yeah. Because, and we talked about this with Nash a little bit. And like we've said this on our first podcast is it's like right now, blockchain is very similar to like, you know, web one where it's like, we're talking about like protocols and we're talking about like all these different mechanisms that are going to keep these networks alive. But like people that are like alive today and like use Facebook or whatever, like they don't care about like, you know, any of the OSI layer models. They don't care about any of that stuff. Right. (laughs) And it's like, if, when you talk to people about it, it's like, it's very important for them to be able to just like pick it up and use it. Mm -hmm. Like I can't imagine like, even if you take any other like sector, like video games, like if you had to like program a little bit before you played Mario or you had to like put the hardware together, like how many people would actually do that? Yeah. And I kind of think that's where we're at right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I actually really agree with that. You know, when, when I was starting my career, the only people that use the internet yeah, or in either academia or in technology. Yeah. Nobody, nobody sat around on a browser military or military, (laughs) right? Like it was very specific. You were doing a very specific thing. It was for specific people and like things like Amazon, Facebook, Netflix, none of that would exist if it was still in that way. Right. What happened? It got easy to use. It got, it got consumable. And I a hundred percent agree with you. Like if, if we want crypto to make, if we, if we want the revolution to occur, yeah, it has to be consumable. It has to be approachable. It has to be usable. Um, it, when you were talking, the metaphor that I was thinking, or the, the, the example I was thinking of was the move from a cash based consumer experience to a card swipe based consumer yeah. experience. Why does, why, why do we all have cards and none of us have cash anymore? Yeah. Cause it's easier. Yeah. Like I don't have to count. Just, and it's mm-hmm. and it's less I'm sketchy, yeah. Right? yeah. Like right. a lot of ways, like you don't want to be walking around with a hundred, five hundred thousand dollars in some parts <laughs> no. of like right. town, right? Like you really don't. Like no. like that's that is actually like we talked about this off camera, but like my background is actually in economics, like my first degree, and when you talk about the history of economics and money, it's like I first started with a ledger, then I went to like gold, then I went to cash, and like now we're in like this virtual like you know credit cards and payments, but it always is because of like how easy it is to do the next thing. It's that convenience. It's that reduction of the, the surface area of, of problems yeah. and a convenience layer and the reduction of the problem area and convenience layer. It's like, and yeah, it's like what we do. We just make things easier. Exactly. Like you don't want to be walking around with like a, you know, a bar of gold and like chipping <laughs> yeah. it off. And like, you, you don't want to walk around with I like mean, a bunch of gold token. I mean, it's cool. I kind of want to walk around gonna with a bar of you, gold. Right. And like all yeah, your money's no, gone. For sure. And they're going to walk away really slowly. Cause it's like 70, 78 <laughs> you're pounds. Clicking yeah. it like the whole way down the street. It's like, click, 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 click. But no, your point is solid. Your point is solid. You, yeah. you, you, you can't. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, the same thing, right. To, to get my mom into crypto, she, can't have to be a minor yeah no right like yeah i mean absolutely <laughs> <laughs> like uh, i mean even like the terms that we use today like decentralized application like people aren't going to like the l- legit people that are going to use this and like make it like a general population thing they're not going to know what that is like yeah. they're just going to know it's an app not a decentralized app they're going to yes. know it's an application they're going to know that this is like you know blockchain they're not going to know the networks they're not going to know yeah. the protocols they're not going to know the consensus algorithms right like and it, when we go like when ali and i go to like events like i would tell you even the people in the crypto space i would venture to say like 50 percent of them probably don't know the difference between proof of stake or proof of work right. right like they really don't and like i can't even imagine walking down the street or going to like zupas or something and like pulling up like a cash and like, do you know what proof of stake or proof of work is? And like, what's, which one's better? <laughs> like no one would know. And now I can think about a soup. Yeah. <laughs> soup, <laughs> a soup. The lobster bisque oh, man, that I so love. Good. <laughs> so good. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I mean, it, you can even take it away from the crypto space and say the exact same thing. Right? Yeah. You can go pull Netflix Anything. users and be like, what's an API? Yeah. And they'd be like, what? And yeah. the only reason Netflix works is APIs, right? Yeah. Like, there that that foundational technology that supports the delivery of whatever functionality feature set service that you that your consumers want mm. nobody cares how it works as long as it works mm. and they only care if it doesn't work yeah right and i guess the true word is actually called abstraction yes absolutely right? Layers so like, of abstraction. so it's like you know when i get in my car and i press on the gas like i don't actually know combustion engine like i don't know the visa i don't know what's happening yeah, i just know yeah. it's going yeah and that's where we need to get to with blockchain for people yes. to actually use it is they just need to hop in their car and use whatever service and they don't they might not even know that it's like crypto being traded on the back end mm-hmm. but that's kind of where it's going to go i think yeah. hopefully <laughs> i think we all hope in this room yeah. and like yeah. most people we interact with for sure wanted to get it there yeah 
but it's going to take a minute and it's going to take people like you and other people with similar like minds to automate this stuff and like make it easier for us to eventually get there. Cause like, you know, white warlock dudes in their basement, I mean, aren't <laughs> going to solve the problem for all of us. Right. Yes, we are. We will fix everything <laughs> for you. Well, it's funny cause you're using the car metaphor and I'm sitting here going, yeah. See like a systems as a systems engineer, I'm the guy that knows that the throttle body is connected to linkage yeah. and like there's a pulley arm that's you're stepping on a thing here. If it's not drive by wire and you're pulling that throttle body and it's, you know, and yeah. I said it all wrong. Someone's going to freak There's out and be like, that's like, not how this he works. Doesn't know, he doesn't know anything. About he doesn't know anything about stay but computers. Like, I'm the guy that, yeah, <laughs> stay away from cars, bro. Uh, but no, like I, as a systems engineer, I, uh, that's my bent. But I also have to recognize that that's not how the rest of the world works. Yeah. The rest of the people on this planet, they, they, they aren't exactly like that. Mm. We all have our bents, you know, and but you're absolutely right. We have to. It's going to happen. It's there's there's been no technology innovation that doesn't dramatically improve an aspect of our lives that hasn't taken over. Yeah. It's going to happen. It's it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. But in order for us to be successful, we have to figure out how to make how to how to get it be a part of that happening, right? And how to drive it forward. And to do so and you know, if if we can manage to do so incrementally, we'll help. But if we can do so revolutionarily like do so in a big way then we can actually do something really cool yeah and have some fun with it. i guess that leads me to like my next question for you is it's like why why are you in this space i mean obviously like we talked about like all the jobs you can have like we said this earlier off camera too yeah. it's like people here like could probably get jobs wherever they want for the most part but like why are you here and like what made you essentially put a bet right like everyone here is putting kind of a bet on blockchain and specifically silverman working out what what why um, I'm at a point in my career where I want to work on something that's going to make a difference, something that's going to change. Um, I was, you know, I started my career in 96. I was right at kind of the tail end. I was the junior IT guy for dot coms. Yeah. So I didn't get any of that. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really a part of any of it. I wasn't yeah. doing the good stuff and then it bust. And so I didn't, I didn't really get to be a part of that. But this, this evolution, this revolution, I can be a part of it. You know, I can do something in this space. Um, it's also a strategic move on my part. I'm not old enough to be thinking about retirement. Yeah. So I should be investing in myself and developing skills in the next phase of technology. Yeah. And there's multiple areas that you could be in right now to and do this. Crypto is without exception the weirdest. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, bring on the weird. I'll, yeah. I'll go that way. Um I just, I, I, you know, and then from a personal perspective, I just really like the energy in crypto. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I also am a person who runs towards confrontation. And I feel like the area where some of the most interesting confrontational conversations are happening is in this crypto space. Yeah. And, you know, around crypto, but also around other things in, in the world, I feel like the most interesting conversations are happening space yeah um so yeah that's it for me I, and then I, mean, I also you know like you also sorry yeah no no i the team that's assembled yeah like, I've, I've known nash for a while i've met mike and, and you know the other the rest of the team that's here as well like this is and we talked about this off camera this is a special place man yeah we've got an exceptional amount of intelligence and an exceptional amount of talent and commitment and passion mm -hmm. in this one team and i think that it's actually going to do something pretty big. Yeah. It's funny because like when I talk to my buddies that are like in different spaces, whether that's like Google or wherever, it's like they always think they're in the cutting edge. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like we here are in the cutting edge. Like people that are taking this like leap of faith, that hopefully this technology works out. This is where it's at. Yep. And it's such like a niche area where it's like, you know, you get like these Mike Stay type characters, Nash Foster, like, you know, like you get them because they're like very interested in what can come out of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we always make like a, you know, like a comparison between like the dot com burst and like sort of what's happening now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I kind of welcome it in a weird way because I think in a lot of ways it's going to like burn down all these projects that like just are no good. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And you look, you reflect back on the dot com bust. Uh, there are a few very notable companies that did yeah, not like bust. Mm -hmm. Amazon, Amazon, Google, <laughs> yeah, Google, like well, Yahoo for a while before. Yeah, like, but yeah. I mean, and and the reason Yahoo failed is probably nothing to do with not the yeah. bust. It was you know a bad business. Took some bad business decisions, <laughs> yeah. right? 
and and they got outplayed. Yeah, you know. So, but that's my point is we talk about it like that era, like oh the dot com boom and the dot com bust and everything flatlined, except for how many millionaires got produced. Yeah, in that ten year period, more than in the rest of the previous hundred years. Like it's crazy, right? And and this is that to the next order of magnitude. Exciting. Yeah. Yeah, it's exciting. And that, you know, this is something we talked about off camera. We, we have a lot of yeah. conversations. I, I mean, that's what I do around here. Yeah. I just like pull people aside. Like I'm like talking to them for like 30, 40 we, minutes. We need to just put cameras up yeah. and have them going all the just time. Like I need like a, you know, the doggy cameras that people put on the dogs <laughs> to see what they do when they leave their home. They need to do that to me on my forehead and I walk around and <laughs> have these great conversation. conversations. And then people are like, why didn't you just do that as a podcast? And I'm like, I don't know. Cause I just like talking to people here. And it, a lot of that for me too is like, kind of like what you were talking about a second ago is it's like when I first got this job, I actually went home and like sat in my parents' living room and cried because I was so happy I got that job. Like nice. I, like I don't want to work at like, I mean, Google, Yahoo, like Yahoo, Google, Microsoft, <laughs> like all of these Titans in the space, like those are fantastic places to work. Like there's no doubt about it. You're going to be happy probably for a while <laughs> working yeah. there. But like, this is like, to me, when you work in this space, there's like legacies up for grabs. Yep. And like that to me is what draws me in the most is it's like, if you want your name cemented in history, you have to go where the bleeding edge is. Yeah. And this is yeah. where it's at. Yeah. And there's no, there should anybody watching this, there should, you should never take away that working in, in these, in these successful businesses that are developed is, is a bad thing. Yeah. There are great places to work. Some of them more than others, some of them less. Yeah. And the same can be said for crypto, but you're absolutely right. Like when I, when I got this job, uh, I spent six, you know, six months agonizing over it, going yeah. back and forth with Nash about uh, how it would work, where would I be, what, you know, and then, you know, I, I have a habit of when I'm ready to make a decision on a job, I like cut off the talk with the, the company and I go and talk to my family and it, the, the hinge point for me, like the key turning point for me in deciding to take the job was how uncomfortable concept made me yeah it was uncomfortable to move from a safe corporate place into that and i think that you can't you can't be a part of something that is going to be revolutionary and be comfortable yeah mm -hmm. that can't happen i don't think it's ever happened no i don't think <laughs> you can be in a place that's causing change <laughs> yeah. and be comfortable yeah. like even small personal things all the way out to very big yeah you know macro things you you have to be uncomfortable to make change and i was like okay all right, I can, I, I can, I have a career. I don't have any concerns about being able to be employed. And what do I want to do? Do I want to, do I want to like, I always think of them in terms of failing. Mm -hmm. Do I want to fail comfortably? <laughs> or do I want to fail trying to do something? Yeah. Right. And I'm probably not going to fail. Yeah. Uh, it's not a, it's not a, mode that i often am yeah. in and so i'm not too worried about failure mm -hmm. um also side note fail a lot yeah don't yeah. ever be afraid to fail yeah that's like the only way you're gonna get better right. the only way you actually live a good life yeah. is by failing a lot yeah. and then yeah. learning from it and like, don't from just those. fail <laughs> yeah <laughs> like you have to learn from your failures <laughs> because if you're just constantly failing then that's no good either yeah but like you got to I mean, take I'm, something away from it i could probably write a master class of failure <laughs> yeah um Dude. but yeah don't be afraid of failure but that that comfort level you absolutely are right you, yeah you you have to be uncomfortable and the reason i made it when you said that you went home and cried yeah. that made me smile it made me like genuinely happy because that's passion yeah right nobody goes home and cries about their job at microsoft no right well it, that's well, not, not yeah, <laughs> yeah. positively really. and there's probably someone who is so excited to land in microsoft yeah. that they but that's passion right yeah. that's that's passion you're interested in something and yeah. i will tell you the surefire way to kill anybody's creativity is to steal that passion yeah. to put them in something they're not passionate about and they'll just sit there and they'll wilt yeah right and I, like for me too, like when we, when I was first going, like, cause I, I mean, I think I might've told this story before, but like I went to hacker X and that's kind of how I found them. Like I found pyro effects. Right. And like, I didn't know how legit it was. I was like very skeptic hippo. I was like, I was like layer one, like, I don't know, man. And then it's like, I started talking to them and like, 
you know, I, I came in for, I did a phone interview and that kind of, it took a little while before I got my phone interview, but then I met like Mike and Nash. And I was like, Oh my God, like these guys are legit. Mm-hmm. Like this is not like a play thing anymore. Like when, when I first met, I, I, it's so funny. When I first met Mike's day, like it was like during like a, well, first of all, at Hacker Expo, when I met him to do an interview, like I go into the interview room and like, we're talking for like maybe like 10 minutes. And he's just like, all right, let's recreate MetaMask right now. <laughs> he just like starts whiteboarding on the wall and we're like talking. I'm like, what is going on here? Like, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Of. Just cause like for, for a layer one, like, and Kelly always says, this is like um, by design, like we're very low key. Like we pick and choose the talent we want selectively, but we're not like just like casting a wide net, like, you know, like Microsoft and Google, like just by design, they're so big that they have to cast this wide net and pull in people, right? Like people are going to get hired at Google every year, like yep. by the truckload. By the truckload. But when you're at a smaller company, you have the ability to actually pick and choose exactly who you want. And I mean, to, to kind of talk about this, like Kelly for the last three weeks has been interviewing people nonstop. Mm-hmm. You look at your calendar. It's like, I think she's interviewed like 20 something people, like technical interviews. And like, she's like, one is kind of, kind of made it. Yeah. And that was like from the, like, you know, the truckload of resumes we had to the people we actually interviewed to like, you know, no one, like no one's even come on campus at all. Yeah. Like no one. No one. Yeah, no, she's, um, uh, some of the roles she's, she's looking to fill are, are, yeah. are with my team. Um, my, my team of one right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I haven't heard from her at all. Yeah. And it's, and that's, you know, we, we, uh, we had a conversation about it. Nash, Kelly and I had a conversation. I mean, and I'm sure they've had more. In fact, I know they've had more conversations about it but we had a conversation about the fact that that is singularly the most important thing you can do in an organization is is select who's going to be a part uh it's the the selection process is costly hiring process is costly potential demoralization is costly um a bad hire is more expensive than almost anything else it can destroy a whole team yeah especially when it's this small yeah and when your team is small you can't afford attrition yeah you cannot afford it because retraining somebody oh my gosh yeah it, and, it, and we've got me yeah right we add one more and they literally take half of what i'm doing and we lose that person yeah or that person doesn't work out and causes one of the other team members to leave or yeah yeah it's it's it is the most critical thing you can do and um i've been in organizations that don't take it seriously yeah. and the performance of the organization reflects that yeah I, I mean, it's so funny because like you would never know this, but like w- when Allie and I started working together, we like started talking about the things we like. Mm-hmm. We were like, oh, so you like this? Like you have this car? Like you do? <laughs> like we, it was like, favorite. it was like so weird down to the T. And then it's like, we bring Marcus in and it's like the three of us are just like the happiest little clams <laughs> yeah. like ever. And it's just like, how does this work? Like they're clearly hiring people that yeah. are like meshing together because it feels like we, we've only been here for a few months or whatever. It hasn't even been a full year. Yeah. And it feels like we've worked together for so long. And it's just like, because we drive so well and that's yeah. how everyone is here. Like everyone jives, like no one hates mm-hmm. each other. Like even if they have different political views, religious yeah. views, it's like everyone has the ability to kind of get over that. Yeah. And I love that because it's like, none of us are like, you know, sip from like the Kool-Aid, you know, at all. It's like every single person here brings something new. And it's like, yeah. whether they clash or not, at the end of the day, we all still work together and like no one's hating each other. No. And like, that's like a rare yeah. thing to find. Yeah. It's in as much as you guys have like kind of shared yeah. things, neither of None of you are like each other. Yeah, exactly. Like you, you're all very unique, you know, and um, same with everybody else on this team. There's no one person that's mm. really like anyone yeah. else here. And yet we are the right mindset, the right personality types where we can remain supportive and respectful and kind and yeah. communicative. And um, I remember uh, yesterday, it was yesterday, everyone was kind of wiped out from the late night session. We had, yeah yeah i came in and saw you guys on here and was like hey you know checking on everybody i was like the only kind of i was like the senior officer on that yeah <laughs> that day because everybody else was out and doing other stuff so i'm like are you guys doing okay and i was talking with kelly later um i was like she's like ah, you know i don't know how the temperature of the office is i'm like yeah. dude your team is sitting in that room door closed just knitting together yeah <laughs> they're like becoming a tight unit yeah and i'm like i think you know i i was I really enjoyed it because I'm like, I think that might be 
their first real late night, you know, working through something <laughs> hard thing that they did together. Yeah. They're like stitching together as a team. I thought it was super cool. Yeah. It, it's funny because that, that's kind of how it's been literally since Marcus got here. Like, it's like, we all just like, <laughs> like yeah. we all just like hung out same thing i mean yeah we love matt too it's just that the three of us do a lot more together yeah. yeah so it's like obviously the three of us are like collectively have to and it's not like i don't think i have the mindset because sometimes you go into a job and you're like i hate this person but i have to like <laughs> but like i have to like work with them yeah you, like every single person has had that person right oh yeah they like sit next to them like god Beth, I hate you, but like, I have to do paperwork <laughs> with you. So you're just always cordial. Like none of us are like that with each yeah. other. Like no. we all genuinely like each other. Like we all invite each other everywhere. And like yeah. that extends out to the, like other, you know, the dev side too. Cause we're obviously yeah. on the product team. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's same in our boat, same in our boat. Yeah. We, uh, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not native here. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm in town for a month and to do exactly this and mm-hmm. actually connect. And so yeah. it's, it's fun for me to see the way you guys work together and see, how this team works together. And it's the same on our side, on the tech yeah. side too. Like we we're all working in different spaces and in different ways and different uh, methods, but we all come together and can talk and we all come together and yeah. communicate. And you know, yesterday was a good example. Another off camera conversation. Yeah. There was a really solid conversation that happened yesterday. Yeah. People were very, very motivated in, in, in this conversation and they were very engaged and there was some passion in the conversation. Yeah. And at the end of it, knuckles, we're good. Everybody's fine. Nobody's upset. But you can have an exchange of ideas that is challenging and you still have these people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kind. Yeah. And-, and it's so weird though. Like, like honestly, it's so strange because it's like every place you go to, they're like, don't talk politics. Don't talk religion. <laughs> like people openly talk here and it's just like, whatever. <laughs> like, okay, like move yeah. on. And we have people on all sides of the spectrum, dude. Like it's not like it's like all right or all left people. It's like all it's meshed together and like people talk about it and it's just like oh yeah but i think that's kind of like what draws people into crypto in a weird way is i kind of think it takes a collective unit of people with different ideas yeah. to build the next frontier in technology yeah absolutely absolutely that, that was part of the conversation yesterday or yesterday was like we gotta we've gotta actually figure out how to come together yeah not not compromise on our ideals or change people's minds but like actually work on problems together yeah. like if we let our differences divide us we're just not going to get anything done we're not going to move forward yeah um so I, I think it's i i think that the strength of humanity has been found in our ability to come together yeah and it's never been about being the same the beauty in us has always been our differences yeah I and mean, that's what that's what makes this place cool is how different things are there's this um always think back to this weird youtube video uh there's a there's a man who who has a disability where he um can't see color there's a specific word for it of course i don't have the word for it but he had a device put on him Mm. that uh it communicates color via sound and Mm. you know one of the things he talks about is like we all see everybody i talk to they, they talk about how they're different from each other it's like but you're not you're all orange. Yeah. <laughs> you're nice. all shades of yeah, orange. All the- <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, funny. that's amazing. Right. Like, like anyways, I, yeah. I think one of the things really remarkable about our culture is that, like, yeah. that we can be different and still be together yeah. and still work together. Yeah, I, I would venture to say that like the more, cause what we're talking about here is almost like tribalism. Like people yeah. get kind of caught up in their own little tribes and like, they don't yeah. want to go past it. But I think once you break out of that, you can build a lot of beautiful things together. And like, whether that's like a country like the United States or yeah. like, whether that's like a company like Pyrofx, right. There's a lot of beautiful things that come together when you can knock down those barriers and just like work together and yeah. figure it out. Yeah. And bringing your different skills to the table makes a difference in the end product. Yeah. If there, you know, if, if everybody in the room were the same, you wouldn't have a need for the, for yeah. anybody else in that room. I want to go into a room where everybody is different because the richness of the solution that's that, that, that gets developed in a room with a high degree of diversity is going to be a greater degree of richness than a room full of everybody who's the same. Yeah. You've got to have different experiences. You got to have different takes. And like, it would be boring. It'd be, be honest, apart from like, that, why, yeah. I don't want to yeah. walk into a boring. room with a bunch of people like me. You know, a bunch of like, you know, what's really funny is we're talking about this and I've been laughing about it all day, but we're all almost exactly identical. 
Yeah. yeah. Which is really funny that we're talking about this, but we're all literally like, in shades of gray right so now. We're so against it. We're white. all wearing like black and darker <laughs> shades. We're just like, That's right. like, but we're all different. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we are. I swear. <laughs> no, for real. That's funny. I, I guess like, um, I always like to ask people this and it's more or less like, where do you see this going? Like, where do you see the space going to? And like, more or less like, I told you not to ask broad questions. That was, we had <laughs> one rule, which was do not ask I'm broad sorry. questions. No, no, no. Um, do you mean crypto as a whole? I, I guess like a question that I asked Nash specifically was I said, um, where, like, what do you think your kids are going to see develop from this space? And it's a hard question. Honestly, it's it is like, question. it's not like you need, like, I think he took a second to think about it too. Cause he was like, yeah. Just because I, I, I always think of like my nieces and like my nephew, they're yeah. younger than me and more or less like the technology, like if we're successful here, like what's going to come of it for them, and like the generations after them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I guess to preface my response, I think that's where we find ourselves right now in yeah. the space is, okay, so this thing does some stuff. Yeah. What do we want to do with it? Right. Yeah. Like, how do we make this practical? How do we make this usable? Um, you know, I think the stabilization of currency, um, you know, there's um, reducing disparity in wealth. There's lots of other things that can happen on a larger scale, but, you know, removal of centralized control of the transfer of wealth. Yeah. Um, every period in history is uh, of great change is preceded and followed by transition of wealth. And there's a huge transition of wealth that's happening. Um, but one of the differences in this evolution is that we have a chance to remove the centralized control of that transfer of wealth. Yeah. And I, that's the thing I want to see happen. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to go down the tyranny route or the conspiracy route or any of the negativity, but I can say that the more objective controls we have in place where people aren't making the decision about other people, the more objective controls we have in place, the more rational the outcomes become. Yeah. Um, and I, I think there's, there's a too far and there's a not far enough and there's some sweet spot in there, but really, you know, and I see, I told you, man, I didn't end up on like crypto that's okay. Evolution stuff. Yeah. Um, but, you know, right now, I, you know, I, mean, I, I have I think, a 19, a 12, and a four-year-old. Yeah. My four-year-old, he's going to see a completely different world. Yeah. When he's when he's an adult, it's going to be a completely different world. Yeah. And is it, are we still going to have cards that we swipe? Probably. Because it's a lot less scary for someone to steal your wallet than it is to steal your hand. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, um, so it'll probably be a card, but what's behind that card? How does the transaction system work? How does this all work? That's going to be really different. My 12-year-old, she's probably going to have the ability to do currency transactions inside of games in a way that's transmittable across multiple games, right? Yeah. Um, my 19-year-old, he's, you know, he's probably tagging along not far behind us. and Yeah. He's going to be a part of this revolution. And I, I think it's a hard question, too, because Kelly always says, like, in our product meetings and um, when she's talking to, like, developers or projects, that, like, it's that's a hard question because when we're building the foundation for other people to build stuff on. Yep. So it's like, it's like asking the person who like, you know, I mean, asking like Bill Gates, like, you know, what are people going to do with this product? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Like they're going to do something <laughs> like he, something he, crazy. Like he, I, he's got some famous quotes of yeah. how short sighted he was at that exactly. time. Exactly. Right? Like he even says like, I, I think if I'm not mistaken, like he was like saying like, it was kind of against like websites or something, right? Like something, what do you say about, Ugh, I'm gonna have to look that up, but yeah. regardless, people in this space, it's hard to make like predictions because you're always gonna be wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, you'll almost certainly be wrong. Yeah, right? um, yeah, you know, from a systems perspective, and from you know, to take it back to what I do, one of the big differences is the the true and widespread implementation of decentralized technologies. Yeah, most of my career, and one of the biggest challenges of switching to crypto, most of my career, if not nearly all of it has been on centralized, centralized technologies. Yeah. Servers in the cabinet run the system and then consumers out in the world that use it. Flipping that completely around. Yeah. And now it's 
all the servers are out in the world and all the consumers are out in the world. And how do you create scalable networks to do this? But people were talking about that when I was starting my career. Yeah. But now it's actually happening. Yeah. Right. And so that's one of the that's going to be a huge difference. You know, it's, what's that going to mean to data center infrastructure? Yeah. Like, are we going to see a, re, uh, a, a resurgence of these? Like, um, there's a company called Speakeasy. No. .net in Seattle, where it's all shared infrastructure. We're going to see where a resurgence of data centers. Data centers are nearly on the verge of collapse. Yeah. Um, well, especially like internal ones for sure. Yeah. Like, right? I mean, cloud storage, like yeah. in my last position, like that was like our whole thing was it's like, we got to get rid of these servers and sell them on like Microsoft cloud. And that's like, you know, yeah. what's going to get, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think that it's just, I, what I love about it is just, it's really up to your imagination. Cause I would have never seen, I've been, more or less around crypto since the beginning. And I never knew like NFTs were going to be like a thing. Like I never, like who would have seen that? Who could have, who could have foreseen like, NFTs? Who could have predicted yeah. most of these things that we're going to see? Like, Somebody that watches this is going to be like, yeah. I did. Yeah, leave that in the comments. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what's even wilder is like thinking about like, um, like Bitcoin and like how it all started yeah. all of this. Right. Like, cause well, as much as like, I, I mean, I'm not the biggest Bitcoin person in the world and I'll tell people that privately. But it did something, it pushed us forward, and it's like now we're kind of dealing with everything that comes from that. Yeah. Right? Like who would have known that like decentralized applications would have been like a thing and everything else? I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, and that's, you know, to go back to an earlier comment I made, you know, there's once, once the box has been opened on an innovation, it's inevitable that it gets adopted and implemented. Right? Yeah. It's, and this is a big one. Yeah. This is a major one. And it's... There's tons of thoughts around you know, why it hasn't happened sooner, but the reality is we're kind of at this magical intersection of um, hardware capabilities and internet capabilities and then generalized understanding and generalized techno technological knowledge. And you know, it's software languages that are much more easily approachable. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't need people to write Fortran to do yeah. this, right? You know, they can do it in Go do it in ruby in rust there's all these different simplified languages that can be used and so we have people that can implement we have technology that is affordable that can run it we have networks that are fast enough and stable enough to support it yeah. and so it's sort of this magical connection of, of capability yeah. um that that is enabling all of it yeah. um it's yeah it's kind of a cool it, it I, I always wonder what history will think or what it will write about the time that we're in. Yeah. And I, I, I feel like we're in a in very interesting period of history. And later on, when, when, when the history is written about this time period, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be really interesting. Yeah. I think it's going to concern us. <laughs> like, yeah. Like whether, you know, I, and again, I'm not going to like shill out Silverman. I'm just saying the technology <laughs> itself, like, right. Yeah, like yeah. I think blockchain is going to do a lot of things that people never even thought was going to happen. Yeah. yeah. And Nash will always say that like, you know, the comparison to like, you know, people building newspapers or making newspapers, like you don't get newspapers anymore. Really? Like you have to go kind of out of your way to get newspapers. And that's because you have your phone and you're always going to get the media that you want. You don't have to go to like, and like, we're seeing that now with like CNN and Fox, like, you know, their, their numbers are tanking every right. single day. At one point they controlled the narrative and it's like now the decentralization of like news, you can start, like we have this podcast, right? Like we talk about crypto stuff, like CNN's not doing this. Fox news isn't doing this. Like we're bringing people on that are in the space and actually talking about news and relevant things in our own space. Yeah. That could have never been done 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the the person who invented the printing printing press. Yeah, would they have envisioned blogs? Exactly. Right. No. Wouldn't yeah. have been possible. There's too many stairs, too many steps in the chain yeah. between them and blogs. But but that's what's <laughs> beautiful about technology is kind of like, yeah. and we're doing a full circle here because we're almost towards the end. But like you talking about like the foundation of different levels, like that's what technology is at its mm -hmm. core. Is it's like people building great ideas on top of each other, and then like you don't even know what could possible five layers from that. Yep. That's not like blockchain layers, but actual like layers of technology and what people's visions are for each one. Yeah. So I think that's a good place to stop for us just because it's getting hot in here. We still need it to get really AC warm. in here. Yeah. But I think that's a good place to stop with this one. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah, absolutely. It's fun. It's great. Yeah.